Google. So welcome, everyone. This is going to be our regularly scheduled. We didn't do it for the first two weeks because I didn't have the equipment set up. Our regularly scheduled uh, Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Check the school calendar. It's, our, it's there for the remainder of the semester where we're going to be talking about uh, various topics. Bobby's coming in. Hey, I'm, hey Bobby. How you doing? I may mute, mute you guys at, uh, at occasional times here just to kind of... Uh, keep the noise level down, but I definitely want to get into some conversation. But this is going to be our MoGraph mentor kind of headquarter hangout informal talking about various things, um, looking at student work, stuff like that. Today, I want to touch on visual essay stuff. Class one students are just getting into the visual essay. Um, class two students are several weeks into it. We did kind of an overlap thing. Um, where they split it between class one and class two. We're actually changing back to the old way, but um, just want to talk about some kind of the production stuff and some good tips maybe for class one students who, um, who may be either just confused about it or struggling with the idea of producing their first short film, which can seem incredibly daunting if you're newer to design or just production generally. Um, so where do we want to start? First, I just want to talk about this first... Um, and I'm going to do a little screen share action here. This first PDF, what we call the kind of pre-production PDF, where we want people to kind of spell out their, let's go ahead and screen share, where people spell out their concept. And just as an example, this is something that, uh, this was a kind of a visual essay I had played around with wanting to produce. Um, and I kind of put together as an example. Um, so just in terms of a topic, one, uh, one thing that's a really good idea for students to do is to take an existing piece of audio, something from a book, something from a TED Talk, um, you know, some really you know, great philosopher on YouTube that's got a great 15, 20 second rant that's just really speaks to you. Um, here, I one of my favorite all time little uh, little uh, stories is from an economist named Milton Friedman, um, which you may or may not have uh, come across this uh, this little story he tells, but he's trying to help people understand what is so special about the modern global economy and people trading with each other. And he talks about it through the through the through the story of a pencil in that. And he sums it up by saying, no one person can make a pencil. And just to paraphrase it, you know, you kind of go through the script. Um, and the good thing about this starting point is like, well, the script is already written. I'm just kind of condensing what he's saying. So he's saying, look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Uh, the wood from which it's made comes from a tree in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, you need a saw. To make a saw, you need steel. To make steel, you need iron ore. Um, you know, the lead in the pencil, it's really graphite. It comes from mines in South America. But then you also need rubber, which comes from... Uh, Malaya. Um, then he says the rubber tree isn't even native. That was actually brought in by British uh, businessmen long ago. Um, so it takes literally thousands of people cooperating to create a single pencil. You don't have the resources in any one place. People who don't speak the same language, people who practice different religions, uh, they may even hate each other, yet they can like silently negotiate with each other um, basically through the price system, right? He's talking about how things, um, how we can collaborate just through uh, the price system. And we don't even have to know each other or like each other, but we still collaborate through our economies. Um, so then when we're asking for visual reference, this is kind of what we mean when we say visual reference is starting to find um, just some early images. I don't really mean like mood boards yet, but just finding, you know, what are the proportions of a pencil? What is that, you know, what are the colors of a pencil? Really simple things like that. You know, I was looking for some images when he's talking about the state of Washington. Um, then when he goes into the iron ore part, I like had to Google that stuff, like how the hell does graphite and all that stuff even look before it gets produced. Um, so really simple visual references is what we think students should be looking at early. Um, talking about the mines in South America. So like, you know, some of the some of the way housing is built in that country is interesting. Then into the uh, Malaya part of it. Uh, the rubber tree, which is actually a really wild looking tree, uh, which I discovered, which is really interesting. 
So here's these rubber trees, and it's actually this super crazy process where they like cut, they cut the bark of the tree, and this white goo just comes dripping out the side that then they collect and capture, and that actually becomes the base material for a process to make, uh, to make the rubber. Later in it, he's talking more about the price system. He's criticizing what happened in the Soviet Union, how they had economic czars setting prices, saying this costs this, this costs this, as, a, as opposed to letting prices float like we do now in most of the world. Um, so that's why I have these references of a czar. I wanted to see what the hat looked like and, you know, like the outfits and stuff like that. Um, and here, actually, just like some actual, um, I don't know, algorithms or uh, you wouldn't even call it an algorithm, but like a formula for how price mechanics work. Um, which I don't really fully understand, but I needed some visuals that maybe that maybe could work um, in that capacity. And then just your your classic, you know, the world was exceptionally poor, and then all a whole bunch of countries started trading with each other, and then the world has gotten super rich in like the last two hundred years. So that's really interesting. Um, so when we talk about this pre-production document, this is really what we mean. So I hope that if any students in class one are confused, about this first uh, this first week going into week four for the visual essay, this is what we mean, right? You don't have to have everything figured out yet, but just let us know the concept, um, kind of that first draft of the script, and then really start looking for the visual references that are gonna help you uh, start to zero in on what visually, what are the images you're gonna create, what are the pictures you're gonna create, uh, the illustrations or the designs or 3D or whatever the execution's gonna be, um, thinking about some of those things. Now, the next step after this is to get into um, is to get into storyboarding, right? So, I took a I took a pass at doing um, just kind of a first pass at some storyboard stuff, and of course, starting with the pencil, right? There's got to be a rad pencil design. I'm kind of thinking maybe I build that element in 3D. I'm thinking the piece has a 2D feel, but like. You know, I'll do some like flat cell shader on the pencil so I can kind of rotate it and do and have a little more flexibility with it. Um, maybe some more, uh, some just some typography in and around the pencil, really, really simple frames. Um, as you can see, the script is kind of long and I have a lot of shots in it. Um, so if this was a class one student, I would probably even be asking them to pull back, pull back, pull back. This is way more than 30 seconds, but the first pass of storyboards probably should be more fleshed out so you can try to decide like what your best visual sequences could be before you really like start chopping away um, at maybe the, the ideas that aren't as strong. Um, so then we get into like no one person can make a pencil. So, you know, I thought maybe just a single character trying to, uh, trying to make a pencil to, to try to emphasize that really it can't be done. Um, so we've got your state of Washington, single character, cutting down a tree. This was my idea of how I could represent Washington. You know, the iconic, uh, right, just get that one iconic Seattle tower. Someone can, someone can tell me the name of that. But um, then like a single mountain maybe on the other side of the comp with just a single tree. Really, really simplistic idea. Um, you know, then we got to get a look at the saw. Then the iron ore stuff I thought could be really interesting and pretty just because some of those textures are really, really interesting in some of my visual references. Um, the way a pencil gets assembled, how you've got the, you know, the wood that gets formed and the graphite that gets kind of strung through the center. Um, then into these rubber tree segments. And so big theme here, like really simplistic. I do have some characters in some environments, but not a lot. Um, and the comps are really, really simple. Tons of negative space, keeping things really, really simplistic. I think the rubber tree shot is probably potentially one of the cooler moments in these boards. Um, if I could get something really interesting going with that white goo coming out and then those flags to kind of talk about um, the way in which it it was like multiple people from multiple countries even even wanting to put a rubber tree in that part of the world, right? You can't make a video without a classic wide shot of planet Earth, right? So got the, the wide shot. That's not, that's not the greatest idea. There's probably a better way to go about that. That could probably be redone. Um, going through more of these frames where we're talking about people cooperating 
across languages, across cultures, across religions, right? Muslims and Christians, you know, they can hate each other, but it's still in their best interest to trade with each other, um, that sort of thing. Uh, here we have the czar, he's criticizing, you know, trying to plan an entire economy with just a few people. I just straight screenshotted some of these uh, some of these formulas, thinking like actually it'd be kind of interesting to get those in there, um, and then back to the pencil. So definitely feels like a first pass of storyboards, and there's way too much. Um, yes, Space Needle. Thank you, Steve. The Space Needle in Seattle. Um, let me go back to uh, to stop screen sharing here. So so big themes, right? Um, I do have some characters, but not a lot. One of the biggest, um, one of the biggest pitfalls I see in people planning their visual essays is, and for whatever reason, our mind just goes to it naturally, is trying to do a lot of, you know, people in places doing things. So like students will write the you know, there's there's a crowd of people and then there's a guy at the front and then he walks over here and then the crowd does something. Um, character design, character animation, environmental design, these are disciplines unto themselves and they take time to really get better at. It's like, I've been doing this for a long time. I still find it extremely slow to like figure its character designs out. Um, character animation is obviously extremely tedious and slow because you've got to find ways to build the rigs if you're keeping it in 2D. Um, so just really something to keep in mind if you're just starting the, the class one visual essay, um, maybe take some inspiration from my boards or other places to think about visual metaphors that might also tell the story. It doesn't always have to be people. And one example um, from a recent project that I talked a little bit about last semester, I'm just going to go back to Photoshop here, was I had a client um, talking about uh, government stuff. And um, the shot that they wanted was, and you guys can watch me draw like a hack here in real time. Um, basically, it was talking about government policy and um, truth decay, how truth was like falling apart. So the client comes and basically their first idea was something along the lines of you know and let me just like block out some people here um i need a crowd i don't want to draw every person they wanted like a crowd of people here right crowds that's always an, that's always a disaster um and all these people are standing in front of a government building so like the classic pillars of a government building type of thing. And they wanted, they wanted like a single figure kind of up more towards the top, you know, like lying his ass off type of thing. Like <laughs> who could, who could that be? <clears throat> so we, so they have this idea of like, okay, we want this shot. And then in the background, they want the, they want the pillars to start like breaking up, right. And like start falling apart. And they want this thing, like the top, to start tilting down and the crowd's holding signs and they've got, you know, they're protesting and they're saying, stop being such a liar. Um, timely, timely stuff. So this is kind of what they're thinking now. I'm definitely not opposed to that. I think that's a cool idea in and of itself. But with the budget and the timeline that we had and the number of shots that we had, it was an absurd request. And I had to tell them like, it's probably not going to be doable to do that many characters. We only had like two weeks to do probably like 30 shots. So it's like, well, that single shot would eat up. It would take me like two days to design that probably like two full days to like really dial in that design, you know, do characters. It's like with two weeks to turn it around, you're just, you're just way off base. Um, you know, people in places doing things. Maybe we've got like the Washington monument on one side in the background we have kind of this back foreground and you know maybe like uh some more government buildings that looks kind of like a penis it's not supposed to so my pitch to them was okay well we're not going to do that but what we could do is like start with some text first that kind of does a thing and then for our more dramatic visual analogy 
why don't we do a single a single pillar right like a single pillar that's a great looking pillar where then we zoom in on this single shot it's like you know the, the frame is really empty kind of thing um maybe we do like a little shadow and we we kind of flow into this moment of a single pillar and then we watch the pillar start to crumble right so we like see pieces fall apart and then they kind of fall onto the ground and then this and then this starts to break down it's like that felt way more realistic to me on the timeline that we had and the idea could be very similar and i felt like given the voiceover and like the whole context of it it would communicate largely the same thing now it's not nearly as cool to do a single uh pillar although i really like simplistic uh compositions where there's just like a single visual analogy um but it's just an example of the like people in places doing things versus what I would actually term a visual metaphor. Um, so this is my this is my short advice to students in the visual essay. You've got only nine weeks to produce however many shots you're going to produce. Um, I would be considering if your if your if your mind immediately goes to people and places doing things, um, consider visual metaphor alternatives. Right, consider more simplistic ways to tell kind of a similar story. Um, and in this one, it's like, I felt like if I had a little more time to focus on the crumble of a single pillar, it would be way more interesting and it would be way more refined. And I'd be able to take a little more time to like kind of work on the animation of each part of it. And we could still have this same idea of decay, which was kind of their main point that they wanted to get across. So this is, oh, Travis Krauss, what's up, bud? I see you coming in. How's it going, dude? Um, so that is, that's a really big thing. That's, um, that's an area we run into a lot. The easiest way to blow up your visual essay and not finish it and just sputter out and feel frustrated is to, is to pursue something way too ambitious that is just not going to be possible in a nine-week production window, right? Um, now, now some of you, some of you in here have produced some visual essays, so feel free to, you know, chime in. We can kind of open it up to um, discussion if um, if you feel I'm off base here. But for my money, some of the best visual essays we've seen, and so, you know, what Martin did his was at a semester ago, two semesters ago, about a new narrative, where he's talking about uh, the the excerpt from World Humanitarian Day. A lot of really simple compositions in there. There's not characters running around, like one comp is just a single eye, right? What a powerful just single image and visual metaphor for a human being, the single eye. Um, or I'm, you know, I'm looking at the frames over here in the room, like talking about DNA, right? One of one, one double helix DNA in the composition. Again, like a really simple, powerful uh, visual metaphor. Stuff like that works really good on a tight, timeline and works good um, with the tools that we have too, right? When we're working with Cinema 4D and After Effects and it's a lot of circles and squares and simple shapes, um, trying to find really powerful visual metaphors and doing good stuff with type is, um, is a good way to, to go about producing it, especially if environmental design, character design, character animation, if you're brand new to that stuff, start with more simple ideas, right? Animate a single eye, a single eye blink, before you decide you need to animate someone walking across the screen and like do, doing an action. Um, so that is my, um, that's my two cents on that side of it when you're going into the storyboard phase is kind of thinking about these simplistic, um, simplistic ideas. Let me go back to screen share and feel free to chime in, uh, gentlemen, if you, if you want. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is actually this lecture from Alex, and this is on the MoGraph Mentor website. And I was mocking up kind of a version of this so we could give you guys, uh, you guys and gals, a 
um, kind of a template. So within the MoGraph Mentor Library, that's where I am here on the website. If you go down to Alex Mapar's entries, just the very first one, he has this hour and a half lecture on on planning a production, right? A lot of the stuff they do at Buck, a lot of the stuff that they do to keep their stuff organized. And uh, spoiler alert, it's spreadsheets, right? It's it's going into Google Docs, creating a spreadsheet, and thinking about your film in the context of shots, right? You know, motion design sometimes isn't the greatest term because we're kind of filmmakers too, right? You're producing a film here. You have to think about every part of it. It's not just that we're graphic designers doing a magazine. This is multimedia. And, and I almost think filmmaker sometimes is a better term to describe a lot of what we do. Um, and filmmakers have to think about their work in shots. And Alex is really great at making clear that this really is the best way to go about it. Think about it in terms of shots. And so he creates these spreadsheets where if you can read it there, right, VO on the left side of the panel, like what's what's the VO saying? Then he does a visuals A um, column where it's like, okay, just write your first pass of the idea. Like what's the first go uh, of your idea of the visual? Then he does a visuals B column where he's refining the idea, right? Maybe now he's had some discussion with the directors or the animators or whoever else he's bringing in to have that discussion. Um, and now he's got a slightly more refined idea. Then he goes into his, you know, what he calls the scribble, right? Like just, okay, how's that blocked out? Super simple, take 10 seconds. Okay, it's blocked out like that. Um, then he's got a couple more columns, right, of slightly more refined to all the way till we get till style, to, to style frames. So, you know, with Alex, he's encouraging his students always to produce their films. It's like the once the first animatic gets created, it's like then you're just basically filling in shot by shot by shot till the very end, right? It's like so it's almost like in animatic mode till the very end. And he's thinking about it in a shot by shot basis. Um, and he put together this really simple, this really simple example. Um, and I'm going to create. I'm sitting here working on a uh, a spreadsheet, a Google Doc spreadsheet, which I'm going to export and go ahead and throw onto the um, onto the campus site this morning. That's basically we're just copying what Alex does here, but it's blank. So if you just want the spreadsheet, I mean, it take you 10 minutes to set it up, but maybe you just want to uh, just grab the blank one and go ahead and throw that in there. But um, you know, if you've got the time, scrub through this, scrub through this lecture with Alex. Take a look at the way he does things. There's a hell of a lot more stuff in here from Alex actually um, about the way he refines scripts, about the way he thinks about story arcs, and some of those direct, uh, those director concepts. I think the other, um, the other probably best thing to look at on there is um, is from Colin Hesterly's Directors Academy uh, presentations on the website where. If you're in that storyboarding week and you're worried that your storyboards don't look good enough or they're too rough, like go look at the way Colin's boards look on week one because they're really, really rough, right? Like he's not taking time refining drawings. He's thinking about the big picture problem, which is like, what the hell do we even put in the frame? Like what is the thing that belongs on screen at this point in time? Um, so yeah, so that is my you know 20 minutes or so here of advice on uh, the way to attack the early stages of this visual visual essay. Thinking about visual metaphors, resisting the urge to, and I know our brain always goes to it of thinking about a person in a place doing a thing. There's so many other images you can show people um, that could maybe even be more interesting and maybe even add a bit of like, I don't know, a bit of mystery or just like make it seem even deeper in a sense than just doing a literal translation of the voiceover of, you know, if, if you're talking about someone going to the store of, you know, um, you know, I was walking to the store this morning, instead of a literal interpretation of that line, what other ways could you, could you put something on screen that, that communicates it? So, um, that's just a few things, a few things to keep in mind. If you're kick-ass at character design and character animation, and you can and you can breeze through that stuff, um, then that's amazing, and you and you can definitely uh, play in that world. Um, but just know we've seen it so many times over. People have too uh, too ambitious a concept, either the length of the, of the script, or that the execution just isn't possible within a nine week a nine week production. So. 
that's just some that's just some friendly advice on doing the visual essay. Um, so, Steve, you are in class two right now. Um, tell me a little bit about your visual essay, and we could maybe even pull up some stuff from the Dropbox here. Um, and let's talk about how you feel like it's going. Uh-oh. I can't hear you for some reason. Do we have you muted? I don't think so. Hmm. Uh, look at the look at the gear icon and make sure you've got the right audio input selected. Maybe that'd be the only that'd be the only thing. So Michael says, uh, does thinking in visual metaphors always turn out a stronger video in your experience, or have there been projects where being more literal was a better method? I mean, you know, designing characters and animating them and, you know, Alex, we were just talking about the, the piece that IV Animation did and it's like all characters and all that kick-ass stuff. It's like if you have the time and the skill to do it, you can make amazing, you can make amazing stuff. And human beings love to see stuff that looks like them. So we like to see the human face and we like to see human bodies doing things that we can recognize. Um, you know, for the visual essay, I think the best ones we've seen, like Travis did a really, really good one. Um, Kyle Predke did a good one. It was a lot of visual metaphor stuff. It just works better for graphic designers, I think, and illustrators um, to keep it simple, especially because you're typically producing anywhere from seven to like 20 shots. And in nine weeks, that's a lot. That's a tall order. So um, if you had like four shots and you had characters, I'd think, okay, you could probably have the time to wrestle with that and like go through the trenches with that kind of concept. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a time, definitely a time thing. Do we have you back, Steve? I, there you go. There you go. What's um, up? I'm actually in the first boat of biting off more than you can chew, okay. but I kind of committed to it because it's a good story to tell. And since it's the hundredth anniversary of the end of World War One, it kind of goes with it. Mm. Um, so mine is during the beginnings of flight. They didn't have a lot of instruments to be able to tell how fast they were going and that kind of thing. So they taught them to pace the airplanes with the jackrabbit. And when the airplane was going the same speed as the jackrabbit, they knew they could take off. Mm. So mine involves animals, airplanes, character animation. Yeah. And uh, I'm part of the, the split. So David Conklin helped, you know, guide me through the technical aspects of it in class one and Nydia Diaz, she's kind of helped me rein it in so I can concentrate on getting things really solid and looking good during class two. And I am, I fully realize that I'm going to have to spend additional time to get this done beyond class two. I see. Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a little screen share here on my end. Um, I've got your boards pulled up here. Um, so do you feel like you need to you need to pull back on any of the boarded out concepts here? Like No, because like students um, in a classroom, could we do a stack of books? Like does it have to be human beings, that many that many character designs? Well, the visual reference i mean the main thing is i could probably do an instructor and a student and then the blackboard shows the aircraft and the rabbit going the same speed mm. um but i kind of want to go with the feel of the period and like i said i'm not worried about it taking longer and i have archival footage from 1918 period so I have plenty of reference for characters. Yeah, sure. And I really only have to model two people in 3D, and then the other ones I can just do flat animation. 
Oh, you're going to create a 3D character model. Yeah, I'm going to do the instructor and the primary student in 3D. The hangar is going to be 3D. The rabbit's going to be 3D. And the airplane's going to be 3D. Mm, okay. Um, so, do you have some mood boards? Do you have mood boards or anything on how you're thinking that? Uh, looking? Which, okay, if you... That's uh, week two, right? If you look in week one, yeah. I actually, if you go down to keep going there so it's gonna Ooh, i want paper the man. look and yeah paper paper man is your man. Reference. <laughs> yep. you should know well, that disney had to create new technology to make that film that's how hard that was to achieve that look yeah i understand but because if if you look at look at the picture with her at the flower stand yeah i mean it's an absolutely gorgeous yeah film. uh i think because of the light, the shallow depth of field and the atmospheric haze, I can get away with more because we're basically talking about a field with aircraft that can be duplicated, hangars that can be duplicated. So the environment's not going to be as detailed. Yeah, um, sure. Let's I mean, in 1918, they literally used fields to fly out of. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, the black and white images do look a lot like the paper man yes. renders. Yeah, I mean, the planes. Yeah, I think I would definitely... I think the plane in 3D is a great idea. That's going to give you a hell of a lot of flexibility. Like, if you take that time to really create a yep. nice model, now you've got a hell of a lot of potential angles to film yep. from. Yeah, and I've got... Uh, I do want to do... I, the cool thing, see, I've taken 2D animation before through School of Motion, and it's very inflexible. You know, you have one view yeah. of the person, you have yeah. one view of the object, whereas in 3D, you can export multiple camera views, and then you can bring it into software and edit them together like you had a five camera shoot yeah so. certainly certainly yeah more yeah. setup time in the beginning but then a lot more flexibility yes um i mean i would i would encourage you to consider more visual metaphor type stuff i really think simple um ideas even within this world could be really um really good but no, I think I'll be interested to see how that how that kind of develops um, in 3D, building out the building out the environments. It is a little more um, right. Well, I've got Same, like uh, these airplane hangers in the background here. Yeah, and I I was able to find blueprints for those, so it's pretty much just drawing rectangles. Sure. Um, the hardest thing is going to be the airplane, and I. That's that's what I see as the biggest obstacle. Probably yeah. the rabbit with the fur. Mm. But uh, yeah. I'm I mean I'm my... actually excited about it. And uh, there's a museum at the base near me that does all the training for enlisted people, and they are interested in it as well. So I'm committed to it. Okay. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, that's. Um... Yeah, I think it's a really cool topic. I love the, um, you know, there's just going to be so many interesting details that are specific to the period that you can that you can kind of emphasize that give us that feel. Yeah. Are you but, thinking of black and white? Black and white yes. is the final. Okay. Yes, it's going to look like a silent movie, mm. and it's going to have that feel. And I have. Uh, I found a recording of a uh, kind of like a uh, the you know silent movie kind of film from 1918. Wesley from Sound Sonos he turned me onto a website that has um, wax cylinder recordings and everything that you can use. Mm. Oh, very cool! Yeah, yeah, the sound design part could add could add a heck of a lot that's a great um, idea. i don't know if you scroll down whether it's got like sample that one includes the sample title card as well but i found a font that looks like the uh silent movie era kind of 
follow the jackrabbit cards. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's cool. The old like silent movie. Yep. Follow that jackrabbit. That's cool. Um oof, right. Like yes. this is what this is what scares me though, Steve. Like look at look at your chart here for models. Come on now. That's a lot that's a lot of stuff. But like I said, I'm I mean if you're committed for the I next know it's, six I know months, it's gonna take I'd longer. Be looking at like six months, honestly. Well, I have to have it done by November eleventh. That's the an okay. the hundredth anniversary of the end of World War One. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but well, hey, Nidia, I Nidia has helped me set reasonable goals for this class, like getting the environments correct and getting the pieces correct. And yeah. if I start testing, you know, camera shots and thing like things like that, it uh, I think it'll be good. Okay. I mean, my, my agenda is okay. The thing I want most for each of each of the students in MoGraph mentor is just to have even just like a few seconds of really refined, gorgeous stuff yep. in yep. their reel or on their portfolio. Like that is the breakthrough people are looking for typically is like, just show me even yep. show me even a badass hat from 1918 floating down into frame, but everything's perfect and on point and it's just right. Like even that, my agenda is like, that's what I want to see from people because that's what art directors want to see. That's what creative directors want to see versus producing something that's three minutes long, but everything's like 40% good. And it's like, well, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be three minutes long. And Nydia has stressed to me the get five, seconds of good animation for this part yeah yeah i think that i think that's wise um travis in the chat here says check out these references on type especially from the time period it's also great to look at uh yeah let's take a look at these thank you travis oh there you go movie title yep. stills collection oh nice yeah i love sites Ooh. like this let me um so people on the broadcast can see what we're talking about. Yeah, I love that one on the left. Damn, that's awesome. I like 45 degree angle with the hand. Yeah, if you click on the 1920 slash 29, it's got some old Buster Keaton movies with the fancy scroll work and stuff like that. And I plan on developing it to almost look like an official army training film but we're going to date it with roman numerals at the bottom so it's a current date yeah right a lot of these serifs they were using um german yeah the mother the dead mother that's pretty that's pretty <laughs> grim sounds pretty german <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's see the orphans of the storm Oh, you can buy these. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that one's interesting. It's like a kind of copper antique looking. Yeah. So Plus. this is this is gonna be like 1918 silent film. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how they were doing that more like yellowish look. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same as photographs, but uh, if they don't fix things properly that's why you get that sepia tone look it's not yeah. intentional it's because of the mm. oxidation mm. oh yeah yeah okay this is a, this is a great reference travis thank you for dropping yeah, thanks, this in travis. here um so any of our other uh guests in here who have already gone through the visual essay you want to kind of chime in here give any advice to some of the people that are now jumping into it alex mike bobby now that Steve's shown how not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> now that we know what Steve's doing for the next six months. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, I mean, I took class one. I was way too ambitious with what I wanted to do. And I didn't find any script or like recording that I wanted to use. So I wrote a script, um, created a character to go from. Um, and so... And I had, I only had one character, but I also wanted this like kind of Colin Hesterly environment because I was 
looking at his stuff for inspiration. And I was just like, before this, I'd only done, you know, PSR stuff, like just some text moving around the screen or something. So, yeah. And then I wanted to go from that to gorgeous, like lake with mountains and this modern architecture with this character playing instruments with strings that moved and stuff. So I was like, looking back, that was a dumb move, I think. Mm. And I, I got through it and it took a long time. And I think some of the straight on shots I really like, but uh, I also was trying to do perspective shots from 45 degrees mm. and uh, hadn't really had a background in perspective or anything. So yeah, those shots I wasn't too happy with um, in the final, final version. So yeah. Um, in the end, I wish I would have gone more stripped back, kind of like the one you showed us at the beginning, Michael. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's this is an interesting process because it reveals how many disciplines are required to produce a certain type of film. Like whether you're talking environmental illustration type stuff, perspective drawing, character design. Um, Sometimes I think motion design, motion graphics, whatever we want to call our job title, is among the harder things to master and to be really great at. And it's also why I think you see a lot of people have lanes that they stay in a lot. Like Colin is very much in that narrative illustration character world. Like you rarely see him doing stuff that looks like Tony Zagarios's 3D glossy stuff. Um, and that's another, I'm not sure it could be done any other way, frankly, like how could you be so great at all those things? You know, maybe after 20 years, you could easily sit down and like make a film that looks like Collins or make a film that looks like Tony's. Um, but I think that's really, I think that's really difficult to do. I mean, that's a good thing about the visual essays that like reveals some of those things so that when now you have your client so like i don't know if after that that served you in any way like then when you sit down with a client and they've got some idea that you're not just like throwing out like what about this and the character does this and like committing yourself to stuff that then you just you're drowning for weeks being like what did i do in terms of this pitch um so even if it's like a fumble and it's like oh well i i did a misstep um really valuable to do that in a student setting versus oh, yeah. Cause I've done it, man. I've definitely, I definitely was doing that early on of just like, you want to make good stuff. You want to make your clients happy. You want to give them what you know they want, which is just kick-ass, you know, world-class stuff. Um, but once you get your butt kicked enough time of like, damn it, I can't just be cranking out 2D mm -hmm. character animation. I just can't do it. You know, unless we have 80 grand and I can hire Enrique or I can hire, you know, Faye Ribeiro, his wife to design the characters. Like, it shows you, uh, it sh it's showed me over time of like messing up so many times early of now when I pitch clients, it's usually like way simplistic stuff of like a lot of PSR stuff, but trying to like sex up the PSR stuff by more interesting visual metaphors or bringing in single illustrations that I really know I can actually execute and spend six or eight hours on a really simple illustration that's nicely refined. Um, versus yeah more bigger environmental stuff which is um which can be frustrating mike how about uh, how about you i think the the biggest thing that i've realized has been within the past week and uh it kind of it's exactly what you guys are talking about but i'm taking a joseph campbell lecture and uh animating it essentially and it involves a samurai and the guy who killed the samurai's master and um the problem that I had was uh, the armor for the samurai. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make all these layers and uh, add all this shading and, and light source and everything. <laughs> and this past week, I think it was partially out of frustration and just out of necessity to get the style frames like solidified or style frame solidified for class. I just made the, the areas where the armor are uh, armor pieces are on his body. I just made them one piece per position. Mm. It took on a basic shape that molded to that part of the body. And I was a lot happier with it. Uh, once I did that, I think it, in a weird way, it was kind of like giving up 
the the desire to be super detailed. Yeah, I'm not there yet. Uh, yeah. Still, you know, and it was it was it was a nice outcome, and it gives me a good base to go from at this point. Yeah, and it's also one of those things of like maybe you don't need the full samurai. Maybe you need the sword. Like maybe you need a way to represent um, the samurai. If you don't mind, Mike, maybe we could pull yeah. up your kind of where you're at here in week two. Yeah, well, we, we, uh, week three has the style frame and the animatic in it. Let's see. Oh, I see. Yeah, that is a complicated design. So this is going to, you're going to fully animate that shot, this shot right here. This guy's no, about to. No, that was one of the other things we talked about where it'll have like a, a parallax effect with some drift in it. The biggest movement will just be his arm uh, coming down in a swinging motion, but you won't see a full arc. Okay. Uh, yeah, like super simple, slight movement to kind of keep the uh, viewer engaged. And Sean actually just sent me a uh, another sample video that I might actually simplify this even more with uh, yeah. the influence. Yeah. No, I think that's a good idea. I think simple. Um... It's definitely helpful. This is a story of a samurai whose overlord had been murdered, and he assumed the duty and task of avenging the murder and vendetta. And he, after years, had finally shot his man against a wall, and his great samurai sword was ready to take off his head. And this chap, who was now cornered like a rat, in fury and distraction and not knowing what to do, spit in his face on the noble warrior put his sword back in the sheath and walked away. Mm. Why? Because that man had made him angry. <laughs> <laughs> I love Joseph Campbell. That's such a great starting point for a film, dude. That's such a great choice. Thanks, yeah. Uh, I love him too, yeah. Yeah, his books are like life-changingly good. Um, I mean, you've got a tall order on your hands here too, Mike. This, yep. this is a lot of character design. Um, what I what I ended up doing with the character design is I looked at the Kurosawa. Uh, I'm going to say it wrong, uh, but Ron or Ran. Uh, I think it's Ron. Uh, I just took I kind of uh, inverted the protagonist to the villain here. I just based the design off of him, and then I think it's the oldest son that's in the red armor in that movie. I, I based the samurai off of him, um, mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to get these very posed shots, right, and just add a little bit of movement. But yeah, yeah, how would you how would you go about simplifying that even more? Because I definitely want to hit the timing target here. Yeah, I mean. I know you've gone pretty far down the path of, let me come back to the, uh, so we can look at the frames here. I mean, this, um, this character design of the face, I think looks pretty good. So it sounds to me like you're almost thinking of this as like, kind of when those photographs come to life a little bit, how it's like mostly still, but then there's that like 10% movement type of thing. Yeah. Um, I think like this shot right here would have some of the, most movement uh, of the whole video where the mountains will actually kind of swing on a pendulum and change color as they do. And they'll, what they'll do is become the horns on the helmet for the next shot. Yeah. Uh, something Sean showed me was to sort of make the mountains and the composition match the helmet mm. uh, for this one. So, mm. Yeah. I, I'm in my mind, it's, it's like a simple movement and color change, right. Yeah. And like zoom out. But in your experience, is it that simple? I mean, this is not a simple film. I'm looking at this animatic. This to me looks pretty complicated. First, just as an illustration issue of like, there's a lot of artwork to do in here. You've got your samurai here at a slight kind of 45 degree, three quarter angle. Mm -hmm. um, so getting that horse, like the horse legs are looking a little off there in the sketch. Yeah. That's that's also from the scan. Uh, it didn't get the whole page. Sorry about that. Um, this one feels really solid. Kind of this flatter angle. Yeah. That one seems to be working pretty nicely. I mean, 
it's like I don't love this style. It looks simple. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely understand that it's going to be damn near impossible to go a lot further than this, like all the way into those fine details and textures that would really um, sell it. I mean, this the, the problem always with characters and like detailed stuff is that uncanny valley where like it's not so simple as to be stylized where it's clearly not attempting to be, you know, more immersive and kind of photo, closer to photo real. Uh, but then to go the other direction is like takes so many hours. Um, I like that you've got like you're putting some light into it, so it's not entirely flat. You've got a specular highlight going on uh, going on the guy on the front here. Yeah. You've got the specular highlight here, so your light source feels really consistent. You're gonna need to um, you're gonna have to work on the fall off, right? We've got light coming from behind. Um, so whether there needs to be some kind of specular highlight just on the, the crest of these mountains on the very edge where yeah. then it just gets darker and we don't see it as much as things fall away, it shouldn't be as visible. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's going to be something you try to deal with in compositing by dialing in layers or kind of blurring some things out to get a better emphasis. The yeah. composition I like in terms of where you have them placed, um, placed in the frame but this is this is precisely why it is so time consuming. It's like you're gonna need to get in here on these fingers and work on these a little bit. Those are feeling a little, uh, a little wonky. Um, let's keep going here. I think the colors, I mean the red and green, I think work nicely together. That's a pretty convincing uh, illustration of the face. So then we're back to the samurai where he's angry after being wow. spit on. And he holsters the sword. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're so far into the people in places doing things that now it's like you're going to have to wrestle with it. And if that's you're the director here, if that's the film you want to make, then you're going to, you know, keep going and do your best. Um, if, if it was like seven weeks ago and we were having this conversation, I'd be like, take three hours and like think about a quick sketch of visual metaphor type pass of like, is there another way entirely for us to hear this VO and see visuals that are way more simplistic, whether it's just the sword in the frame, just the helmet um, type of thing, which I know always sounds weird because it's like, well, that doesn't really tell the story. But then you see someone produce a film that is just those simplistic frames and you're like, shit, that really works. Like I, I still feel like I'm getting a sense of it because the audio is so strong. You know what I mean? Like it just pulls you in. He's such a good storyteller. Um, but no, I would say keep going. I think this is one of those things where like the net, like this is going to whoop your ass. This is so much illustration. You're going to spend so many hours in the trenches with this that you're going to become a way better illustrator <laughs> after this. I, yeah, I, I've already experienced that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there's no way you're not going to come away from this with way stronger set of illustration skills, environmental design skills. So it's not to say you can't do people in places doing things. It's definitely, um, to me, it's almost like the simple stuff and then you go up a level to people, places, doing things, narrative films, which people do like to see. Um, and so maybe that's your path. Maybe you're going to be more of a filmmaker in that narrative mold and be doing more characters and more um, illustrative type things. Um, but it, it's a tall order and whether or not you're going to be able to get through it um, all the way within this period, I think, you know, like Steve was saying, just do your best to, uh, to keep pushing. Hey, one second. Yes. Yeah. Finish. I'll wait until you're done. Okay. Well, I might be another half hour or so. Okay. What do you it's a uh, art and design academy, kind of a portfolio school. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, sorry guys. Um, it's so funny, I was telling Steve, like we have a storefront and people just stand and look in, um, kind of like I'm a zoo animal and they'll just stand there and just like watch, watch me sitting here at the computer. It's been really funny, but... Um, Okay, so I saw Muhammad came in but left. Maybe he had to go. Uh, Travis, you want to weigh in on this? Travis, um, let's pull up Travis's visual essay. 
Actually, I'm just going to go to the MoGraph Mentor student work page. Do it on Vimeo. So Travis, if I remember correctly, Travis's visual essay was was the baseball short. That was that was the visual essay, I believe. Let me uh, let me go screen share here again. Um, I don't I can't believe Google Hangout doesn't let you screen share and see the video feed. That's definite weakness. Base broad is cigar smoke, hot roasted peanuts, ladies day down in front, take me out for the ball game, the seven inning stretch, and the star spangled banner. In baseball, democracy shines its clearest. The only race that matters is a race of the bag. The creed is a rule book in color, merely something to distinguish one team's uniform from another. This is a game for America, this baseball, as simple as a ball and bat, and yet as complex as the American spirit it symbolizes. So really good script. Um, really, really fantastic example of the kind of visual metaphor stuff we're talking about. You know, it goes like, I think one of my one of my favorite frames from the film is, you know, saying seventh inning stretch and it's a hot dog and a beer being open. Like what a simple way to emphasize the idea of the seventh inning stretch. People are going to go get the hot dog and the beer. And this comes back to that, like, show me five seconds of really polished. The can slides in perfect right on the sound design. You know, you hear the, um, you hear it open, um, that type of thing. So we, there is character stuff here. Uh, highly, this, com this comes back to our discussion too about the uncanny valley. It's like, this is so stylized that it's like all the way on that other end of the spectrum where you it's so forgiving because right we're just using we're using lines and negative space and a couple of little stroked lines for the hair um it's like you either got to do this you got to go so stylized that it's like a graphic version of it um or kind of go kind of go that other direction and you know i don't think i counted the shots but it's like after the title one two three four five Six, seven. I mean, there might be about 12 shots in here and simple shots, right? A lot of negative space. But because it's so simple, I feel like Travis had time to dial in these transitions, right? The way that the paint on the legs, um, you know, then morphs in some time for that 2D frame by frame stuff morphing into the state's um, illustration and like, Travis, you smart son of a gun. It's like the the stitching from the baseball creates the outline. Like, I wish I would have thought of that. That's a really great idea, Travis. That is Travis is a fantastic designer. I'm a huge fan of um, Travis's work. But it's a really good example of a way to be successful in that short in that short production period. And Travis did this back when our curriculum, I think, only gave six or seven weeks for the visual essay. So like even a more crunched. Um, even a more crunched uh, production schedule. So, Travis, what do you have to say for yourself with this fantastic uh, visual essay here? Stop doing the screen share. And I know Travis is working, so maybe he doesn't have uh, time to weigh in. But, um, yeah, I think we're probably on being a little redundant here on just like, but I think it's just a matter of thinking about the types of films we can produce. It's like the kind of versions whether it's going to be visual metaphor stuff, whether it's going to be people and places doing things, narrative stuff. Um, and like for me, when I'm talking with clients, it's like, unless there's the money to bring in really great people, it's all, I'm almost a hundred percent of the time. Like what would be a nice visual metaphor for this, you know, part of the VO. Um, so Travis says, I always try to steer clear of the nose visuals. <laughs> nose, you mean like the no a nose on a face? Is that what you mean, Travis? I, th I think he means like literal on the nose. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm slow. I'm slow. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. yeah, I'm on the nose. Excuse me. I need to learn to read on the nose visuals. Yeah, and that's the thing too. Like it can almost feel silly at first to do to do stuff of like, you know, democracy's decaying. So I'll just show a single pillar that's falling apart. Like at first it almost seems strange, but then if you do it nicely and you see it with the you hear it with the VO somehow it just it's great like it, it just seems to work and because this stuff is so hard because animation's so hard and so slow and always you know the first pass of everything we do is never quite that good it's always we're, we're always blocking things in and then it takes time to figure stuff out um that the 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 simpler the core idea to communicate the more we can play with the details whether that means animation so travis says there's no right or wrong People embrace that when they are greeted with less visual information. And you had really good sound design in that piece. Like, what's the quote? Someone can attribute it, but like, you know, they say like 70% of video is audio. Like a huge part of the experience of watching multimedia is what we're hearing and the music and the sound design and the little noise that's underneath there. Um, that's why like Mike, the, the Joseph Campbell one, like I could just hear that with a black screen and it makes me smile because of the way he delivers it and he's got that warm kind of voice and um, less visual information can definitely be can definitely be successful. Um, and you know tra the track on the the baseball film is really good and it's like it's got that old timey uh, that old timey feel. Travis, is that a piece of audio you took from somewhere, or did you did you beat that audio up? Or was that all self-contained? I know there's like a couple sound effects in there. Uh, let's see. They start to lose their brain to connect the visual and the thoughts, voice, and sound design. Yeah, I got it. All animated and sent final picture off. And the sound designers just knocked it out of the park. Okay. <laughs> all right. So you, so you had collaborators too. And that's another valid thing of like, it's from YouTube. I took the speech and cut it up. Yeah. That's always a great starting point too, is just to grab a, grab a piece of audio that saves you probably two weeks of like working with a narrator. Um, and that's, it's actually a lot longer. Yes. And condense, condense, condense. I think your runtime on the film is 38 seconds, right? So it's like short screen time, super simple visuals. Um, but let me go back to screen share really quick. Like, what an all-time great frame. Talking about America and you're talking about baseball, reconstructing the frame with bats and balls. Damn it. Also something I wish I was clever enough to think of. What a great little visual metaphor. Um, and then just stylistically, how you've got the, you know, the shadow pass sitting in the blue, like keeping your color palette that simplistic too. Such a great choice. It feels so, um, so stylized and cohesive. And um, just really, really nice. This is the other great thing about being so simplistic is like the lines on these bats. It's like, Travis, I can tell you did these in Photoshop, each one, because like the same number of lines aren't even on. It's not like you just duplicated the same bat. Some of these bats appear to my eye to have even a slightly different shape. So like having the time to even illustrate six bats from scratch and you may have I don't know if you if you're just tricking me and you did duplicate these but these all look a little different to me like you did each of these from scratch and that th those are those little details that like that get you the conversation at giant ant or get you the client like these little details that show um, show that kind of polish and expertise so uh, Travis says Lucas really forced me to cut things down keep cutting keep cutting keep cutting yeah um, and Lucas is just beyond fantastic. And Lucas is probably a great person to look at in terms of um, really great visual metaphors. He's so good about using the frame to tell a story without um, just characters, although they do they do a lot of character stuff at Buck, obviously. But um, okay, we've been going for about an hour here on this discussion. Let me uh, okay, stop screen sharing there. Um, so Steve's got a link from Michael here for some illustration reference. So Travis says the baseball frame, that was actually the first frame I made. Took me maybe 30 minutes to execute. It came supernatural. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so let's see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for some more references there. So for any class one students uh, or even class two students watching this, just I think good um, good things to consider here from students who are going through it now, who have been through it, um, some of this discussion about the various ways to approach a film. Um, again, no right and no wrong way, but just a matter of uh, of trying to tell the story and find ways to be able to execute within a, within a specific timeline. And I actually really like that we're on the nine week production schedule for the visual essay now, just because for me and clients, I feel like eight, weeks is the most common time frame I receive like as a request from clients typically is like, hey, we really need this thing. Like, can we do it in two months? Because for a lot of companies, it's like even two months feels like a long time to them. But in our world, it's like, okay, two months is tight. Eight weeks is tight. You know, eight to 12 weeks is a lot of what I'll tell clients if it's 60 seconds. And even eight to 12 weeks, if the budget's low and I can't bring in collaborators, it's like, okay, visual metaphors, simplistic stuff, text like gonna have to be simple that's not that's not a ton of time um so yeah i think just good just good food for thought here uh steve says don't do what i'm doing do what travis is doing <laughs> uh yes thank you travis appreciate you hanging out giving us some uh, some insights into your film there anybody have any final uh thoughts questions comments they want to get on the record before we before we get back to work here I'm going to take that as a no. And uh, so, like I said, we're back to our regularly scheduled Thursday mornings. I'm really digging Google Hangouts um, for stuff like this. So I think we'll keep doing it uh, this way. And um, yeah, we'll kind of try to change it up each week, what we're talking about and uh, talking about student work and seeing stuff develops. Good to Steve and Mike. We'll keep uh, checking in on progress here. Um, and obviously, you got your your big sessions with your with your groups. But um, thank you all for taking some time to hang out. Please have a great Thursday and uh, we'll see everybody see everybody soon. Cool.